just doesn't get up and walk out the door, okay? There's more to the story than what you're telling me. Okay, I've talked to James. My partner's talked to James extensively. And James is coming off of this slowly. I would suggest for you, just tell me the truth now. It was February of 2021 when a little boy was reported missing in Middleton, Ohio, by his mother and her boyfriend. An extensive and exhaustive search for the little boy commenced. But it wouldn't take long before somebody made a disturbing confession. A confession that would lead to shockwaves across the nation and across social media. It was around 10.15am on Sunday morning, the 28th of February 2021, when a couple went to Middleton Police Station. They were 29-year-old Brittany Gosney and her boyfriend, 42-year-old James Hamilton. They informed police that Gosney's six-year-old son, James Hutchinson, was missing. They said that they had awoken in the morning to find that James was missing from their home. They explained to the police that they had searched for James for a couple of hours but to no avail, and then came down to the police station. The family lived on Crawford Street, and James was a first grade student at Rosa Parks Elementary School. The principal of the school, Tracy Neely, said that James was a happy and outgoing student. He was a real lovable little boy, who would greet his teachers each morning with a massive hug. Even when he returned to school with the COVID protocols in place, James always tried to sneak in a hug, or at the very least, a high five. James was described as a white male, standing at around three feet tall and weighing around 42 pounds. He had red hair and blue eyes. According to Gosney, her son was wearing a red shirt with blue and red Batman pyjama pants. Police would ask the public to keep an eye out for James and call police if they saw him. Straight away, police were suspicious of Gosney and Hamilton. When they came in to report James missing, they both had conflicting versions of events when it came to the last time that they had seen James. It appeared as though they couldn't quite get their story straight. So naturally, police separated them and spoke to them individually. Hamilton said that he had awoken at around 3.45 a.m. to find James missing. He said that he searched for James on foot and then in his van but said he came home and took over-the-counter medication and fell asleep, before waking up at 8.30am to search for James again. It wouldn't take long until the truth finally came out, and it was more horrific than anybody could have ever imagined. When investigators momentarily left the interrogation room, Hamilton could be heard asking himself, Man, why did this boy have to do this? James, why do you do this stupid stuff? In the other interrogation room, other investigators were speaking with Gosney, and her fake story had also begun to unravel. Hamilton was informed of this, but he asked how much longer the interrogation is going to take, stating, I have to look for my son. I need my medication. Meanwhile, in the interrogation room next door, Gosney was coming clean. While she had tried to lie about what had happened, she got caught up in her own lies, and she was called out by the investigator. Honey, I caught you in like five lies in about two minutes. A six-year-old just doesn't get up and walk out the door, okay? There's more to the story than what you're telling me, okay? I've talked to James. My partner's talked to James extensively, and James is coming off of this slowly. I would suggest for you... Just tell me the truth now. As a forewarning, the following details are disturbing and describe the murder of a child. After sticking to her story for several hours, Gosney finally told investigators that around 3am on the Saturday morning, she had driven James and his two siblings, who were nine years old and seven years old, to Rush Run Wildlife Area in Somerville. The wildlife area is quite the hidden gem, and a popular spot for walkers. In fact, the family had been fishing in the area beforehand. Gosney, however, 
wasn't taking her children there for an early morning day trip. She explained that she took James and his siblings to the relatively isolated area to either scare them or abandon them. She pulled over in the parking lot and she ordered the three children out of the van. And I told him, because he had to use the bathroom too, I told him I wasn't going to leave him. Mm-hmm. Well, I was thinking about leaving them, so I kind of like pulled off a little bit, and James fell kind of down on his knees, got mm-hmm. back, went to go get back up, and then just dropped. Did you hit him with the van then? No, I didn't hit him with the van. Okay. I didn't run him over. I didn't do none of that. Okay. Um. So he hits the. He van. had the. The van door slides open, mm-hmm. so he had a handle of the van. So the door is open. No, they slide back. Right. It's a minivan. Right. They slide back. He had the handle of the van, the mm-hmm. back door van, on the driver's side. And when I went to go kind of pull off, he didn't have the handle in his hand. Mm-hmm. It was kind of just like standing there. Not close, close to the van, but just kind of standing there, holding the van door, trying to get back in. Mm-hmm. Well, that door, out of that door is messed up, right? And it, it I don't want to unlock. It don't want to lock. So, um, I went to go pull off, and James, as I was saying, he was a walk. He fell, tried to get back up, and he fell and hit his head on the ground. Gosney said that she didn't run James over, but said that he had reached out and held onto the van door handle, presumably trying to get back into the van. It was late at night, dark, and the idea of being out in the wilderness alone would be terrifying for even most adults, never mind children. James grabbed a hold of the door handle and clung on for life while Gosney drove off at a high rate of speed, dragging her son for some distance. Gosney explained that James eventually let go of the door handle and she continued to drive. She said she returned to the scene around 30 to 40 minutes later and said she found James dead in the middle of the parking lot. He had sustained a head injury. She ordered the two other children to get back into the van and bundled James's lifeless body back in with them. She told the investigators that she had placed James' body in the van, quote, nice and softly, unquote. Gosney drove back to their home on Crawford Street. She took James upstairs and placed him in a bedroom while the other two children went back to bed. When they were asleep, Gosney and Hamilton drove James's body from the home to Lawrenceburg in Indiana, which was around an hour away. Here they pulled over on the I-275 bridge and threw James's body into the Ohio River after weighing it down with a concrete block. And he had this rope that he got for work use Mm -hmm. and was using it to wrap, I'm guessing wrap the kid, the James and the brick, the center block stopped to the middle of the bridge, told me to get out, Mm -hmm. hurry up and open the back passenger side door. Mm -hmm. And I was to grab his feet and help him toss the child over. When I we tossed him around our uh, the flat because of the brick being heavy. Right. After taking Gosney to the scene where she had tried to abandon her children, they took her back to the police station for more questioning. She opened up a little bit further, providing more poignant details about James's last moments on Earth. She told the investigators that when she pulled up in the parking lot, James didn't want to get out of the van. His two siblings got out but he refused. She stated, I was like, get out. I told the kids I was sorry. The older kids were the only ones who got out. She said that James replied, Mommy, I don't want to be here. James eventually got out of the van, but he kept trying to open the back door to climb back in. She confessed that she knew she had dragged James as he clung onto the handle. She explained that she couldn't hear much because she had the music on loud but said that at one point she heard the children screaming and then heard a noise. But she didn't stop to investigate what this noise was or investigate whether James was okay. 
she simply continued to drive before eventually returning sometime later. Back in the other interrogation room, Hamilton finally began to come clean. He stressed that he had not been with Gosney when James was killed, but he admitted that they had both taken the children out to rush rum beforehand and dropped them off as a scare tactic and a form of punishment. He stated she was supposed to take the kids up there and give them a scare tactic, drop them off for a few minutes and then turn around and go get them, because they was all acting up real bad. Well, all of a sudden she calls me, tells me he's dead. Who's dead? And then told me James was chasing after her and tripped and fell and hit his head, busted his head open and he was dead. Hamilton seemingly became aware that he had given incriminating statements, saying to the investigator, I'm going to jail just for helping her. This isn't fair to me. The investigator replied, It isn't fair to the little boy either. With the gruesome revelation, investigators would embark on the Ohio River to begin the search for James. They were assisted by trained searchers, but the water levels were extremely high and the water was treacherous, which hampered the search. In fact, the rain over the weekend, combined with melting of snow, made it far too difficult to search, and the search needed to be postponed for a while, as water levels were routinely checked to determine when it was safe enough to continue the search. Authorities would hold a press conference to inform the public of the tragic update in the case. They said that they had not yet uncovered a motive for the senseless murder of James, but Police Chief David Burke said that Gosney had not shown any remorse for her actions. She had made the confession during an interview, but they would need to interview her further to try and establish some kind of motive. He said during the press conference, This has really touched my soul and my heart. My kids are older, but the youngest is 16, and I'm just sitting here. You know, the poor six-year-old has no idea what's going on and what's happening, and for the other kids to go through this too. It's just heartbreaking. Following the confessions, Gosney and Hamilton were both arrested. Gosney was charged with murder, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with evidence, while Hamilton was charged with abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence. Gosney's bond was set at $1 million, and Hamilton's was set at $100,000. During the arraignment hearing, Judge Jim Sharon read aloud the charges, to which Gosney replied, I have a learning disability. I don't understand what you're saying. As news of James's murder swept throughout the media, tributes for him would come in. The principal at his school, Tracy Neely, sent out a statement on Monday morning, which read, We are all mourning the loss of our friend James today. James was a happy and joyful soul who loved school. On the days he was in class, he would give hugs to all his teachers as he walked into school. A fond memory I have is the way his face would light up when he won the lucky lunch tray. First graders can find the joy in just about anything. I will always remember his bright joy. Grief counsellors were on hand for any students that needed that extra bit of care or needed somebody to talk through their feelings with. They could also access assistance at home by texting a phone number which would put them in contact with a trained counsellor. In addition to grief counsellors being available at school and at home, the school arranged for therapy dogs to come and visit the students and they would bring much comfort to the kids who were trying to make sense of the tragic loss of their classmate. It was also announced that a celebration of live ceremony was going to be held later in the week at the Barnett Stadium. In a letter to parents, Marlon Stiles, the superintendent, wrote, During this difficult time, I know our middle family will lean on each other while our community mourns. Our community will always find strength when we come together, and I know we will all come together for James. James had lived in Middleton with his mother, Gosney, her boyfriend, Hamilton, and his two siblings, Rachel and Lucas. Gosney and James's father, Lewis Hutchinson, had separated just the year beforehand. Lewis described his son as a great kid, adding that he was really funny and brought joy to everybody who had the opportunity of meeting him. The family had lived quite a transient lifestyle, bouncing from area to area and from hotel to hotel. They had lived in various locations over the preceding years including Kentucky and Florida. 
Gosney and Hamilton had met around a year before James was killed. At the time, Gosney and James's father, Lewis, had moved in with Lewis's sister, Priscilla, and Hamilton, who at the time were actually married, and had been for the past 12 years. The two couples had lived together and raised their children in the same home, until Lewis and his sister began to accuse Gosney and Hamilton of having an affair, which they were. Gosney and Hamilton eventually moved out together and bounced from hotel to hotel, before moving into the home in Middleton, just a week before James was killed. For a while, Gosney had worked as a stalker and cashier at Family Dollar, but said she left due to sexual harassment. She had worked for some time at Croker, but she left that job because of transportation issues. Hamilton didn't have a job either. He had a lengthy criminal record which spanned decades. In 1999, he was convicted of burglary, and then in 2005, he was convicted on a weapons charge. These were both felony convictions. He had also faced a number of misdemeanor charges, which included drug-related offences, disorderly conduct, domestic violence, obstructing official business and possession of an open flask. Gosney also had a fourth child, but years earlier that child had been removed from her care, placed into foster care, and then subsequently adopted. It was quite similar to Gosney's own background. She had lived with her father and his girlfriend, but when she was 12 years old she was removed by Hamilton County Children's Services and was placed in various foster homes before being emancipated at 18 years old. In the wake of the arrests, James's siblings, Rachel and Lucas, were placed into foster care. As investigators were trying to establish a motive, Gosney would provide them with one. She claimed that for some time, Hamilton had been pressuring her to get rid of James and his two siblings. She said that Hamilton beat the children and had tied them up. He had tied up all three of my children. <laughs> Stuck dirty underwear in their mouth. And he was beating them, literally beating them. Okay. I could hear thumps on the floor. Before finally attempting to abandon her three children, Gosney had allegedly explored options to relinquish her parental rights. She explained this in the wake of her arrest, but said that she was met with a number of barriers. On the Monday night, a vigil was held at Garner Park in Middleton. Hundreds of people would show up to pay tribute to James, including his father, Lewis. At the vigil, Lewis said to the crowd, I don't even know how to process all of this. He was just my world. He spoke about happier times, telling those in attendance that he could have been having the worst day in the world, but when he saw his son, that changed. He briefly mentioned Gosney, stating, I don't know how someone could be a monster and do that to a six-year-old. The community would light candles, hold a moment of silence and then release balloons into the air. Some of them chatted with the media, such as Jennifer Mullins, who said that she really hoped that James's body was found so that he could get some peace. In addition to the vigil, a makeshift memorial would take form outside the family's home. There were balloons, candles, toys and signs paying tribute to James. The following day, the tributes continued and a celebration of life was held in James's honour at Barnett Stadium, right beside Rosa Parks Elementary School. During the school day, pupils and teachers wore purple in remembrance of James. At the celebration of life, everybody was welcome. The community gathered with a candle burning in one hand and a balloon in the other. The stadium was filled to the brim. Alongside the podium was a large painting of James. It had been painted by high school students in Rick Krebs' art class. A number of James's teachers would say some heartfelt words about him. One said that his enthusiasm for school was remarkable, while another said, When I close my eyes and picture James, I see him rounding the corner, coming towards the kindergarten classrooms. I see his little hands clenching the straps of his backpack and feet rapidly coming down the hall. He would be the first one to greet me each morning. They all described James as a very well-behaved little boy who was hardworking and who loved to help other students. Superintendent Siles said to the crowd that James's life mattered not only to his family, but to his teachers and his friends at the school, as well as to the entire community. There was a moment of silence, prayer, 
and then a couple of members of the community released balloons and lanterns into the air. Those in attendance spoke about a determination for James's legacy to live on. One parent, Rosetta Hoff, said, James is going to live on because we're going to do everything to make sure that James's life matters to each and every one of us. The community had really come together in the wake of the tragic murder, and they wanted to put their grief into something positive. As a result, city and school officials would establish a trust fund in James's honour that would allow the community to donate money towards James's two siblings. It was named the James Yard Loved Memorial Fund. The money raised would not be used for funeral expenses, as arrangements were already donated for that by members of the community. Just the day after the vigil was held, Gosney was indicted on charges of murder and corpse abuse. She was also charged with involuntary manslaughter and multiple counts of endangering children, abduction and kidnapping. Hamilton was also indicted on charges of kidnapping, two counts of endangering children for alleged crimes, and two counts of gross abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence. Bond was set at $2 million for Gosney and $750,000 for Hamilton. The charges did not carry the possibility of the death penalty if they were convicted. Butler County Prosecutor Michael Gmoser would tell the public, maybe she thought the wolves would get him, but her conduct in the death of this boy was reckless when she hit him with her car, which is a felony. Since neither were charged with aggravated murder, the prosecution would not be seeking the death penalty. The search for James's body still hadn't been able to continue. Recovering a body from a river is extremely difficult, even under conditions that are considered ideal. However, when the water level is high and the current is swift, then that makes it even more difficult, and it lowers the odds of a successful recovery. Captain Rick Buchite from the Butler County Sheriff's Office likened it to a needle in a haystack, stating, There are so many variables. When you consider all of them, you realise how difficult it can be. The water was very fast flowing at the Ohio River, and in addition, it was carrying a lot of debris. Unfortunately, the search would be a high risk to the safety of the diver while searching, as there was every chance they would become trapped underneath the murky waters. Even an experienced rescue team would have struggled. Some questioned whether Gosney and Hamilton were even being truthful about what they had done with James's body. But investigators said that they had both provided the exact same details when it came to how James was disposed of. Their early comments were different in regards to the last time they had seen James, which had aroused suspicion. But investigators believed that they were being truthful when they described throwing James's body into the Ohio River. The search at the river was able to continue just a couple of days after the charges were handed down there were still a number of challenges for the searchers. The weather had been horrendous with lots of rainfall that essentially turned the river into mud. To assist in the search, the Butler County Sheriff's Office sent assets from their emergency response unit, including a helicopter. Butler County Sheriff Richard Jones said, This is a multi-agency effort working together as one. The searchers would also get assistance from the Hamilton County Police Association Search and Recovery Unit who were scanning the water with sonar. The sonar search technology would alert investigators to an area of interest near the Carroll Cropper Bridge, near the Ohio-Indiana border, with Prosecutor Gamoser stating, We had a high level of confidence that this target would be the remains of a human being. Under the circumstances, I and my staff wanted to be present with the hopes that it would pan out. A cadaver dog was brought into the area, and it alerted to the scent of decomposition. It was looking highly likely that investigators were finally going to be able to recover James's body. At the time, investigators were searching the river, not only for James's body, but also for the body of another little boy. Three-year-old Nilo Lattimore, who was thrown into the river alive by Desane Brown, who had stabbed Nilo's mother to death. Divers would search the entire area surrounding the area of interest, but unfortunately no body was found. As the search for James continued, both Gosney and Hamilton entered pleas of not guilty. Gosney's court-appointed defence lawyer, David Washington, would file a motion seeking an insanity plea for his client. The plea read in part, Defendant struggles to assist in her defence and counsel and has serious concerns regarding defendant's mental health. He was also seeking a competency evaluation for Gosney 
as well as a court-ordered mental health assessment which could determine her ability to understand the charges against her and to assist in her defence. He was wanting Gosney to be found not guilty by reason of insanity. Prosecutors would reveal that in the days leading up to James's murder, both Gosney and Hamilton had hogtied the hands and legs of both James and his two siblings and then placed cloths in their mouths and left them in this position in a closet for several hours. Prosecutors wrote that this was done with the purpose to terrorise and or inflict serious physical harm on the three children. This was something that Hamilton had readily confessed to when he was interrogated. Then after James's murder, Gosney and Hamilton had attempted to conceal evidence. They had removed the hard drive from video cameras at their home, which had presumably captured them abusing the children and possibly even carrying James's dead body into the home. They also removed tape and rope and disposed of them. Judge Noah Powers would order the competency evaluation. However, the fact that Gosney had removed the hard drive from the video cameras at the home could hamper the insanity plea because it showed that she certainly had the wherewithal to hide evidence. Towards the end of April, Gosney was found competent to stand trial and based on the psychologist's report, Defence Washington announced his plans to withdraw the insanity plea. This meant that Gosney would be proceeding to trial. With the insanity plea withdrawn, the psychologist's report would be made public. It revealed that Gosney was a childhood sexual assault survivor. It read in part, It was also noted that she did not appear to present with distress as she discussed the offences charged, including the death of her youngest child, instead discussing this in a matter-of-fact manner and presenting with no emotional attachment to others. The psychologist had determined that Gosney had an underlying personality disorder, but was not considered to have a severe mental illness. James's body still hadn't been recovered from the river, and Prosecutor Gamoser said that while it was not necessary to prove murder, they would need more evidence than just a confession. He stated, The body for me, while I would like to have it, is unessential, but you have other evidence of the factual circumstance of the crime other than a mere confession. Confessions are important. They give you a lot of direction. It helps you find other evidence. It tells your investigators where to go and where to look for other things that corroborate certain things. It would be decided that Gosney and Hamilton were going to stand trial separately, with Gosney's trial being scheduled for the 20th of September 2001 and Hamilton's trial afterwards on the 4th of October 2021. By this point in the case, Rachel and Lucas were in foster care and the scholarship fund had reached over $28,000 and had been taken over by Barack and Church in Middleton. Since James's body was still missing, no funeral had yet been held. The search was still being conducted, but not on a continuous basis. Meanwhile, back at court, Gosney's defence attorney would try to get the statements she had made to investigators thrown out as evidence. He argued that her rights had been violated because she did not have an attorney present. He also accused the investigators of taking advantage of Gosney's state of mind during the interrogation, writing, She couldn't have realised what was going on and what was happening around her based on the circumstances. As Gosney's trial was fast approaching, she appeared in court in mid-August. During the court hearing, she unexpectedly pleaded guilty to murder and to counts of felony child endangerment. The guilty plea had been part of a plea agreement in which the remaining 13 counts against Gosney were dismissed. After the guilty plea, a news conference was held, during which Prosecutor Gamoser said, It absolutely is justice for James. He also said that Gosney had given up her right to be referred to as a mother or as a parent. He revealed that the guilty plea carried a sentence of 15 years to life in prison but the sentence would be decided during the sentencing phase. He said that the prosecutor's office would be recommending a life sentence for Gosney. A lot of people within the community had been calling for the death penalty for Gosney. The prosecutor touched on this, stating, There are many in this community that in their heart of hearts the death penalty should apply. It absolutely does not, and never did. Felony murder requires causing the death as a result of an underlying offence of violence. 
In this case, the child endangering did not occur with respect to that child. The plea agreement was certainly a preferable one. James's two siblings would very likely have been called to testify as witnesses. Since they had been abandoned with James and had witnessed their brother die. Testifying at trial would have only led to far more trauma for Rachel and Lucas. And as the prosecutor said, James loved his brother and sister, and he would have wanted to protect them. Gosney's defence lawyer would chat with WLWT, and state his client understood the significance of the decision she made that morning when she tried to abandon her three children, ultimately killing one of them. He said, I think that she's going to have to deal with this for the rest of her life, and her children are going to have to deal with it for the rest of their lives. Hamilton would follow suit, appearing in court shortly thereafter, to plead guilty to kidnapping, gross abuse of a corpse, and two counts of child endangering. These charges related to the abuse of James's siblings and helping dispose of James's body. The hearing had been briefly postponed because Hamilton was said to be upset that part of his plea agreement meant that he would have to register as a violent offender. The sentencing phases would be to follow, but before then, a bench memorialising James was placed at his former elementary school. The bench contained a photograph of James smiling on the back, alongside the words, The greatest thing we can do is help somebody know that they are loved and capable of loving. On the other side of the bench was a silhouette of a boy, with the words, In memory of James Hutchinson, a little boy who loved school, his teachers and his friends. It was a fitting tribute to James and was made possible by community donations and Dodd's memorials in Middleton. Since James's body had not been recovered, the bench symbolised something close to a gravestone. The investigators who worked on the case would attend the sentencing hearing of Gosney, which took place in September. The case had really taken its toll on the investigators, including one who actually left the detective section to return to working on patrol. Chief Burke said, Going through what happened here, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And he was in detectives for a while, assigned to juvenile cases. But he said, I'm going back to the streets. So it really takes a toll on the officers. There would also be Lewis, James's father, and Superintendent Siles, and Principal Neely. Principal Neely actually read a lot of victim impact statement. While he was small, he touched all of our hearts with his red hair and his bright eyes. He was a friend and he was a bright light. Very seldom did he not have a smile on his face and that light was extinguished too soon by his own mother. No sentence will bring James back. All we can do and hope is that his death is not in vain. Our hope is that his legacy shines a light on child abuse. We know that James' life mattered. It mattered to his teachers and his friends at Rosa Parks Elementary. His life mattered to the entire community. Gosney's defence lawyer, Washington, said that he was not going to defend his client's actions, but said, Gosney is an example of when people reach out to try and find help. She, on multiple occasions, with multiple people, told them that she was overwhelmed. She told them that she couldn't handle the situation. I think that factor, combined with mental health issues she had, made her do things that are unexplainable. It is a tragedy for so many reasons. However, it was then revealed by Assistant Prosecutor Kelly Heal that Gosney had refused to reach out to social services for assistance with her three children because she was afraid. While Gosney had earlier claimed that she had sought out ways to relinquish her parental rights, there was no evidence that she had actually done so. She had never contacted any agency which could have provided help. In fact, Gosney hadn't even searched the internet for some kind of advice on giving up parental rights. Brittany Gosney would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 21 years. She was also ordered to enroll with Ohio's Violent Offender Registry for 10 years, if ever released on parole. It was the maximum sentence that could be handed down. Before the sentence was handed down by Judge Powers, Gosney was asked twice if she had anything she wanted to say. Both times, she said no. Outside of court, Prosecutor Gamoser touched on this and underlined what he said was a lack of remorse. He stated, Did any of you hear the words, I'm sorry? Did any of you hear, I apologize for this, to the people of Butler County and to the nation who have followed this case? Hamilton was to be sentenced next, but it was postponed. 
There needed to be a hearing beforehand about whether Hamilton would need to sign on as a violent defender. His defence attorney, Jeremy Evans, argued that Hamilton was not the primary offender in the case and that there was no evidence he had tied up James or his siblings. He admitted that Hamilton had purchased robe just two days before James was killed and admitted that he had told Gosney how to hogtie somebody. However, he was adamant that there was no evidence to show that Hamilton had actually been the one to tie the children up. Hamilton's family would provide handwritten letters to try and secure a more lenient sentence. His sisters read in part, I would like to start by saying sorry to all involved and thank you for the searching everyone is doing. I hope James is found so that he can get a proper burial. There is no way to explain what came over my brother, and he knows deep down it was wrong in so many ways, but he really isn't a bad person. Hamilton's wife, Priscilla, to whom he was still married despite the fact he had moved in with Gosney, also provided a letter, which read, My experience with James is he is a very loving, kind and caring man. He has raised my baby from six months old and never once has harmed her in any way. He was never forced to help with her, but he was more than willing to do so anyway. Prosecutor Gmoser revealed that despite the arguments from Hamilton's defence lawyer, Hamilton had actually admitted to investigators that he had hogtied and gagged James and his two siblings. In fact, Hamilton had admitted to punching and hitting all three of the children and said that Gosney had always been threatening to hogtie them, before finally stating one day, let's go ahead and hogtie them, see if that works. She went to tie her up, and she said, would you please help me? I don't know how to tie nobody mm-hmm. up. I had never did mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure I'll help. Mm-hmm. I did tie the other two up. So. so were they on their stomachs actually hogtied? Mm-hmm. Yes. He admitted that he had purchased the rope threw it on the floor to try and threaten the children, but when they still misbehaved, he said that they both tied them up and put them in the closet upstairs. This same rope was used to tie a concrete block around James before he was thrown into the Ohio River. Hamilton had admitted that this had happened in the hours before the three children were taken to Rush Run. Prosecutor Gamoser said that both the defence team and Hamilton's family were entitled to their own opinion, but so was he, adding... It happened because of evil in the hearts of Gosney and defendant Hamilton. He did monstrous things to little Jimmy. It had also been revealed that the hard drive Gosney and Hamilton had disposed of was recovered. It showed Gosney leaving the residence that night with her three children in tow. At 4.53am, the van returns. Gosney gets out of the car carrying the lifeless body of James. He only has on one shoe. One of his siblings trails behind carrying the other shoe. The next morning, at 2.28am, Gosney can be seen leaving the residence. She walks to the side of the van and opens the door. Moments later, Hamilton comes from the residence, carrying James's lifeless body. He puts him in the van, slams the door, and they drive off. James Hamilton was sentenced to a minimum of 15 years in prison and a maximum of 19 years, and he was ordered to register as a child victim offender and a violent defender once released. Before the sentence was handed down, Hamilton read aloud from a piece of paper. He apologised for his actions, said that he felt remorse, and expressed his hope for James's body to be recovered from the Ohio River. It hurts when I think about what they all had to go through. That night, I thought she was taking the kids some, someplace safe, When I found out what was going on, I told her to bring them back home and she would not listen to me. Lewis, James's father, had tried to provide a victim impact statement, but he was far too overcome with emotion. He handed it to a family member and they read, This unspeakable crime cannot be forgiven. You abused three children so horribly for so long with no regard to their lives. You helped cover up the murder of an innocent, bright-eyed, beautiful six-year-old boy who will never have a life as an adult. James Hutchinson. Remember his name. He was six. We hope that his name and his contagious smile haunt you for the rest of your natural-born life. As far as the other living children, they have a life sentence in their mind and their bodies due to the inflicted abuse that they have witnessed 
In March of 2021, Officer Job Hoover and Detective Tom McIntosh, who had worked tirelessly on the case, received the Butler County Prosecutor's meritorious award. They had been the two detectives to conduct the interrogations and get a confession out of both Gosney and Hamilton. As the two men said, we were just doing our jobs. It was a cold winter morning when James Hutchinson and his brother and sister were loaded into the family van by Brittany Gosney, the one person on earth who should have been there for them. She forced her three confused and cold children out of the car and attempted to make a quick getaway. In that brief moment, James did the only thing he could think of. He reached out for his mother. She pressed her foot to the pedal and took off, with James clinging on for dear life. As the world tried to comprehend how a mother could be so cruel, the search for James's body continued. To this very day, his body has not been recovered, only further compounding the grief of those he left behind, those who did love him and did care for him. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. I'd like to say a big, massive thank you to my amazing new Patreon supporters, Sarah, Mandy, Nicole, Emma, and John. Seriously, thank you so much for joining me on Patreon. Morbidology is a one-woman show, so the support on Patreon seriously goes such a long way. The show really wouldn't exist without you. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon, the link is in the show notes. In exchange for your support, you get ad-free and early release episodes of Morbidology, bonus episodes of Morbidology Plus that aren't on the regular podcast platforms, behind the scenes, including bonus audio, video, and case files. And I also send out a handwritten thank you card with some cool merch. Remember to check us out at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read our true crime articles. Until next time... Take care of yourselves, stay safe, and have an amazing week.